let's start this video with a metaphor. During the latter half of the 1980s, when a certain legend was employed in a circus, he was able to perform two unbelievably amazing tricks that made his peers and audience very impressed. How impressed, you may ask? So impressed that when looking back to his career working at that circus, that legend now as an older man must be wishing that before performing those tricks, he had given that form of disclaimer that became a thing back in the 1970s, but didn't become a popularized trope until later in the 1990s, aka Don't try this at home, kid! And because the legend forgot to tell this to his peers and audience, they of course ended up trying to replicate the legend's tricks on their own. And if you're watching this video, you should probably be able to guess that I'm talking about Alan Moore with his two amazing tricks being Watchmen and The Killing Joke. He has written other hits too, but both of those two comics had such an impact onto the comic book industry that it is still felt to this day when comic book writers today, like Jeff Johns and Tom King, have tried and are still trying to emulate Alan Moore. But seeing how The Killing Joke is a shorter story than Watchmen, I'm naturally going to be talking about that one in this video. The Killing Joke was published as a one-shot comic book graphic novel back in March 1988, written by Alan Moore and drawn by Brian Bowen. It was not exactly an original story, but more of an extension of a 1950s comic book story titled The Man Behind the Red Hood, where the Joker was revealed to have originally been an unnamed criminal using the Red Hood identity, who fell into a vat of chemicals, ended up looking like this, and the rest is history. Supposedly it was meant to be an Elseworld story according to some sources, and that is why Alan Moore was allowed to do whatever he wanted with it. Alan Moore has also gone on the record to tell that he felt like DC's then leading editor Len Wayne should have reined him in for certain choices he made while writing it, but Wayne ended up letting him go along with them strongly. There is more to say about The Killing Joke, its premise and its legacy, but I think it's better to talk about them after I'm done with the plot commentary. Before I start with that, because of YouTube's recently added restrictions, guidelines, such and such, I need to be careful how I word certain events, actions, and give an obligatory content warning. So this video won't end up getting blocked or flagged because I'm talking about this comic. And now that it has been given, you can skip the story commentary to the review part in this time code and to the movie review in this time code. The Killing Joke begins with a cold opening that uses a 9 panels per page format that Tom King has appropriated for most of his written comic book miniseries. In it, we see Batman arriving to Arkham Asylum with Commissioner Gordon running after him and eventually coming to the Joker's cell. As Batman takes a seat across the Joker playing Paciencia, or Solitaire as is more commonly known, the first words of the story are seen looming in the upper left corner before Batman starts talking. The monologue Batman delivers to the unresponsive Joker is about how he has been thinking about their antagonistic relationship, how it has been going, and where Batman wants to talk about it going. This visit is him really making a possibly foolish attempt to reach out and talk things through with his nemesis in averting what could end up happening. But as the Joker does not speak, Batman eventually reaches out to him and seeing the white makeup on his hands causes him to realize that the man in the cell is an imposter and that the Joker has escaped from Arkham once again. The real Joker is then shown to be inspecting a carnival property on sale from its owner accompanying, and the owner must be a very reclusive person as he does not recognize the Joker as a wanted criminal or an escaped mental patient, or question why a potential buyer of his property arrived to the showing dressed like this. While listening to the owner's sales pitch, the Joker is shown flashing back to his previous life as an unnamed, desperate man struggling to make money as a failing comedian to support his pregnant wife. And then after the flashback is over, the Joker discreetly kills the owner with a poisoned handshake while revealing that he has had the owner's partner forced to sign off the property to him already. 
He was only humoring the owner by appearing as a potential buyer when in reality the Joker is already the legal owner of the carnival and kills the previous owner out of cruelty or to not have him protest against the illegal transaction. The next few pages show Batman having returned to the Batcave to go through his files on the Joker and comment to Alfred how after all the time he has been fighting the Joker, neither of them knows who the other one really is. And then we reach the part of the story that people on the internet have been complaining and analyzing over the premise of this story, as well as have been trying to retcon, rewrite, or recreate it to have it happened in another way, or not to have happened at all. In lead up to that, Commissioner Gordon is shown at his apartment adding the newspaper story about the Joker's written escape into his scrapbook, while his daughter Barbara comments as a librarian on certain errors he is doing. Then the doorbell rings, and Barbara goes to answer that, thinking it's a friend she is expecting, but instead it is the Joker who, while Barbara is shocked at the sight of him for a split second, shoots Barbara to the west area, and causes her to fall on the coffee table. As Commissioner Gordon reacts realistically to the situation, the Joker has his goons beat Gordon up while making dark humor commentary on the situation, before moving on to do something that YouTube probably won't let me describe out loud. Then we get an another flashback scene from the Joker's previous life, where he is drowning his sorrows in a bar and revealing that he left a good paying job to become a comedian who barely gets paid anything. The patrons he is shown drinking with are then revealed to be gangsters, who want to pay him well for helping them break into his old workplace and offer to help him hide his identity by wearing a red hood mask, which the gangsters exposition to be used by multiple different people as added anonymity. The pre-Joker agrees to assist the gangsters in their heist on the following Friday. In the present, Barbara has been taken to the hospital after she was discovered alone in her and her dad's apartment. The doctor tending to her diagnoses that Barbara may never walk again, and Detective Harvey Bullock fills Batman in on what has happened, which includes that Barbara was discovered unclothed with a Joker card and a foreign lens cap in the apartment, which suggests that she was being photographed by her assaulter. After Batman asked the doctor and Bullock to leave him alone with Barbara for a moment to talk to her, Barbara is shown to have a very powerful reaction to what she has gone through, as well as being worried for her father. In taking the comfort Batman is giving to her, as she tries to tell her former mentor what she can. Commissioner Gordon is then shown going through what was done to Barbara, as he is also being undressed by the Joker's circus freaks and walked around the carnival that the Joker took for himself earlier. Having been beaten senseless before being brought here, Gordon is confused if he is just having a bad dream before he is brought in front of the Joker and he remembers everything that happened. So begins the psychological torture the Joker delivers to Commissioner Gordon in trying to make him go mad by lecturing him with a word salad as Gordon is led to a haunted house train ride by the circus freaks. The word salad includes a segment about memories, which then leads us to another flashback where the pre-Joker is shown planning out the upcoming heist with the mobsters when two police officers arrive to inform him that there was an accident in his apartment that killed his wife. This of course means that he no longer has the motivation to go through with the heist, but the gangsters are able to coerce him into still going through with it and tell him he can bury his wife in luxury after it's done. The flashback ends by showing the pre-Joker as Gordon is shown in the present, being mentally tortured in the haunted house train ride, where the Joker's word salad turns into a musical performance, with the carnies dancing with the Joker on the screens placed along the ride. And then those screens start showing those pictures that the Joker took of Barbara after Gordon was beaten senseless. And considering how this is the first Gordon sees of his daughter after everything he has gone through tonight, he also has a very very realistic reaction in seeing them as a concerned parent. For the reminder of the train ride, Batman is shown in a montage looking for the Joker and questioning people like the Penguin and some ladies of the night before being called to the GCPD with the bat signal. Their detective Bullock gives him a delivered invitation to the carnival where the Joker has Gordon, who after that haunted house train ride is unresponsive to the Joker, who is asking for feedback from the train ride, but in not getting any, sends Gordon back 
back into his cage before we get to the final flashback. Long story short, three Joker dressed as a Red Hood and the gangsters are supposed to break into a playing card factory next door to the Ace Chemicals building where the three Joker used to work. However, things such as the security detail has been altered since the last he worked there, and both the gangsters end up getting shot, so leaving the three Joker alone dressed in a Red Hood costume to try run away, which leads to Batman appearing, confronting, and frightening him into jumping over the rail into not a bed of chemicals, but rather into the river next to Ace Chemicals, where most of the chemical wastes are dumped into. Huh. Then when he manages to swim far away to get into the shore and take off his Red Hood helmet, the Breed Joker sees his face reflected in the water, which is supposed to be the final nail after all the bad things that have happened to him that force him to snap and so become the Joker. Back to present, Gordon is laughed at in his cage by the Joker's carnies as he continues his word salad, which in this case is about the cruelty of man and how trying to live like Gordon as an example of humanity is a joke to him. And then Batman arrives, ramming the Batmobile into the carnival. The circus freaks flee as Batman exits the Batmobile and faces off against the Joker, who looks at him like his first love before they start fighting, during which the monologue Batman spoke in the opening is told as narration. Ultimately, the Joker manages to flee, and Batman focuses on releasing Commissioner Gordon from the cage. He is shaken from what the Joker put him through, but is still lucid enough to tell Batman to bring the Joker into custody by the usual police procedures. Batman gives Gordon a tarp to wear as a blanket, and then runs after the Joker into the House of Mirrors, where while trying to avoid the traps, the Joker talks to Batman with the loudspeaker system about how one bad day can change everything for anyone, and believing that Gordon has been driven insane as his evidence. While questioning Batman if he ever went through one bad day to become who he is today, the Joker says here something that throws a monkey wrench into the flashbacks we were shown before, as the Joker claims that he sometimes remembers his past multiple different ways. And then the Joker tells a joke about World War III as a metaphor to how life is a joke to which Batman responds in sneak attacking and telling him the joke was not funny the first time he heard. Then as they begin fighting again, Batman tells the Joker that Gordon is still sane without the Joker having managed to break him, and maybe the Joker himself was always so fragile that it took one day to break him into who he is now. The Joker responds to this with denial, anger and violence, which Batman is able to counter, and after the Joker fails to shoot him with a gag gun, the Joker breaks down and temporarily becomes sane in acknowledging all the bad things he has done and that he deserves what is coming to him. Here Batman now offers to the Joker what he came to talk about in the beginning of the story, and asking if they can work together in helping the Joker so that they won't end up killing each other. And from my perspective, as the Joker has temporarily become sane here, he knows that he is too far gone with everything he has done, and trying to help him be rehabilitated is a fool's errand. That then brings us back to the first words told in the beginning, as the Joker in relapsing back into his insanity starts to tell a joke, which I see as a metaphor for his and Batman's relationship in this comic. When Batman gets the joke, he drops his stoic demeanor and begins to laugh with the Joker as the story ends. Okay, let's get the obvious parts of the review out of the way first. As a one-shot story written in 46 pages, Alan Moore managed to write a solid story with the basic structure that needed a beginning, a middle, and an end. All the panels in all the pages serve their purpose in providing visuals for the story being told, with Brian Boland managing to draw every scene, character, and backgrounds with such care that knowing I need to compare them to the animated movie makes me know it won't compare at all. Also, as you have probably noticed, I used the panels from my 2008 Deluxe Edition, which has degree coloring done by Brian Boland, unlike the original publication, which was more pop colorful and showcased the Joker's fragile mindset. This recoloring on the deluxe edition feels cold and sterile, probably to make Batman and the Joker stand out as abnormalities in a clearly more realistic take on the world they exist in. In character writing, Alan Moore managed to write everyone in character, 
while exploring the idea Batman went to talk with the Joker in asking if they can work together towards curing him, which the Joker himself in the end tells Batman in his brief moment of sanity to be too late for him. And this is my interpretation, which could be wrong, but hear me out anyway. Even if the backstory given in The Killing Joke is a false one told by an unreliable narrator, something clearly happened to the Joker before his transformation, and falling into the insanity as he keeps portraying it is indeed a coping mechanism for him to deal with his pain. All the bad things he does are then cries for help in giving those people he is hurting, as well as their loved ones, a reason to kill him. Because after everything that led him to become what he is, the Joker would be expected to want to die, but he lacks the strength to do it himself. Or maybe he does, but needs to make it be a spectacle that makes it mean something. And I think that is what Todd Phillips also recognized for his 2019 Joker movie, where Arthur Fleck was clearly, after everything he went through in the movie, planning to kill himself in the climax during his appearance on the Murray Franklin show, before getting too angry at Franklin and killed him instead. Please get what you fucking deserve! But the fact that Batman and Gordon refused to kill him, even after everything he did in this story, make his plans for assisted suicide fail, and that is the punchline to the joke of a life he is living now. Batman especially, because the Joker sees him as a catalyst to his existence, and so wants to make him take responsibility for his actions by clothing him into being the one to end his pathetic existence. According to Brian Boland, Batman is supposed to be strangling the Joker to death, or reaching to snap his neck as they are both laughing in the end. Even when, one, Batman's hands are nowhere near the Joker's throat or neck, so did you draw that wrong, Brian? Number two, Alan Moore has also clarified that Batman does not kill the Joker in the end, and... Number three, the killing joke was made canon so Batman could not have euthanized the Joker here, as he appears alive in the following stories, like in A Death in the Family. Anyway, that is how I would analyze Joker based on his portrayal in this story, which could be wrong because so many other writers, like Jeff Johns, decided to take it and do their own fanfiction-like takes following it. Which leads us to the legacy of The Killing Joke, and no, I won't be talking about the three Jokers in this video. See, one of those things that Alan Moore has said that he wishes Len Wayne had stopped him from doing as his editor was making Barbara Gordon become paralyzed. In fact, Len Wayne's exact words to Moore were supposedly Yeah, okay, cripple the which really shows how much the character of Barbara Gordon was valued at DC Comics at the time. Before The Killing Joe, Barbara's previous appearance was in Batgirl special, where at the end she retired from being Batgirl, and it was according to some sources meant to set Barbara up in her place in The Killing Joke, so how the hell was this supposed to be an Elseworlds story at all? Anyway, basically what happened was that Barbara was shafted into being turned into a plot device. It was only later when another editor, Kim Yale, and her husband, John Ostrander, decided to revive Barbara's character as Oracle, an information broker living with a disability. And this is a me issue, as from my perspective, Barbara Gordon is a superior character as Oracle than she was as Batgirl. Similar to how Dick Grayson evolved as a character in going from Robin to Nightwing. So, reverting either of them back into being Robin and Batgirl is seen by me as character regression, as well as a huge middle finger against the people who followed in their footsteps in succeeding them. Yes, I do acknowledge that making Barbara become Oracle was done in response by Kim Yale and John Ostrander to what Len Wayne allowed Alan Moore to do. And I try to keep this short, because debating over Barbara being better as Oracle than Batgirl should be its own separate video. Anyway, when the New 52 happened in 2011, Barbara was reverted back into being Batgirl while also keeping the events of the killing joke in her character history, as well as giving Cassandra Kane and Stephanie Brown the middle finger by okay. their existence from the continuity. 
which on its own is not as bad as what was done to Barbara, but was disrespectful to both Cassandra and Stephanie, as well as to everything Barbara had herself built during her time as Oracle. And I should probably move on to talking about the animated movie already, so I leave this issue on a suggestion that no one is probably going to hear or take forward. Leave the killing joke as a branching fork in the road for Barbara's character timeline in future story reboots and media adaptations. Either it does happen and she becomes Oracle while also training Cassandra and Stephanie as the next Batgirls, or it does not happen at all and she remains as Batgirl for however long those future stories she appears him need to. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go get a drink. I cringed so much for those first 30 minutes, and I want to get past talking about it as quickly as possible. Basically, as The Killing Joke was a one-shot graphic novel, with only 46 pages, I counted them myself, the director Sam Liu, producer Bruce Tim, and writer Brian Azzarello felt that they needed to extend the story so that it fit the 75-minute runtime. And for those first 30 minutes, we basically got Bruce Team's commissioned Batman x Batgirl fanfiction. Because in case you didn't know, Bruce Team is one of those people who ships them together as a couple. Unapologetically, without anyone he works with telling him to keep that shit out of his professional work. On paper, Sam Liu Bruce Tim and Brian Azzarello wanted to add Barbara some more agency by adding that 30 minute prologue of Barbara as Batgirl, supposedly as a 3 year veteran vigilante, but she does not come across as any kind of veteran, and the way how she keeps rebelling against Batman during it makes her come across more as Jason Todd during his tenure as Robin. Long story short, because I want to move on from this opening filler, Sam Liu, Bruce Tim, and Brian Azzarello had Barbara get objectified by the prologue's antagonist, while she as Batgirl has an unhealthy crush on Batman, and that leads to something I'm only going to reference with this meme made out of it. That then leads to Barbara retiring from being Batgirl, in a worse fashion than she did at the end of the Batgirl special that came out before the killing joke. All in all, those first 30 minutes mean absolutely nothing to the killing joke, and it would have been much better if it was cut out entirely, with its animation budget being put into improving the animation in the remaining 45 minutes. Or if it was necessary to add this extra long filler prologue, then they should have added Jason Todd as Robin into it as a third wheel to keep this from ever happening. Because in case you didn't know, the killing joke happened before a death in the family, when Jason Todd was still alive and active as Robin. And now I'm going to move on to talking about the 45 minutes that were given to adapt the killing joke story. It's not good. Similar to the Batman Year One adaptation, this could have been a one-to-one -one retelling with certain scenes extended and some more scenes added in between to bridge them, but thanks to the 30-minute prologue, the animation budget for the latter 45 minutes was left limited, and comparing the panels being recreated into the movie, they end up looking stiff and the facial animations end up showing completely different emotions and the voice acting is not helping the matter. Remember last year how I mentioned in my Arkham City video that Mark Hamill was planning to retire from Boy the Joker after that game and would only come back if the killing joke was adapted? 
Well, unfortunately, that return to his work was too bored with a poor script where reciting the dialogue from the comic ended up coming across as just that, with Mark Hamill as the Joker, Kevin Conroy as Batman, Tara Strong as Barbara, and Ray Wise as Commissioner Gordon just reading the dialogue from the comic with their character voices. And again, unfortunately, the script given to them made changes to some scenes where their delivery became too passive or had the wrong emotion being expressed. Let me give you a list of some changes and additions similar to what I did with Batman Year One. Number one, there is no cold opening once the killing joke part of the movie starts. There is more talk than usual, and a setup with Batman and Harvey Bullock discovering Joker's three-year-old victims before he goes to Arkham. Number two, it is not raining as Batman arrives to Arkham, and this cameo by Two-Face is less symbolic in portraying the duality between Batman and the Joker. Number three, the Joker lets the previous owner of the carnival see the renovations begin before he dies. Number four, Jason Todd is shown to have died before this movie even happened by having a picture of his dead body appear on the Bat computer when Batman goes to review his file on the Joker in the Bat game. And I'm just going to say that Batman would never have gone to have that conversation with the Joker if this took place after he killed the closest thing Batman had to a son. Number five, Barbara being shot is shown in slow motion, during which she is shown to react by looking up and down instead of fighting back against the Joker when she sees him. I already mentioned this in my Arkham Knight video last year, where I also said that if Barbara has the time to do that, then she should have had a more defensive reaction rather than just surrendering to her fate. Number six. Because most of the animation budget was thrown at the opening 30 minutes, the pre-Joker in the flashback scene when drowning his sorrows at the bar with the gangsters comes across like he is sober and just talking to the gangsters because that is what the story needs. Number 7. Batman when visiting Barbara in the hospital comes across more passive and Barbara in her shock just lays on her bed without reaching for Batman to comfort her. Which, when we have to acknowledge the opening 30 minutes, is probably where the budget to animate that ended up at, and why the context between their hug would have been different. Number 8. In the flashback where the pre-Joker is told of his wife's death, his reaction to the news is portrayed like he is told some generic bad news, like his favorite TV show got cancelled. Compare that to the shock he actually has when he is told the bad news in the comic. Number 9. The montage of Batman interrogating criminals on where the Joker is replaces the Penguin with this random nameless crime boss, and there is this Nolan Burst trilogy reference in the middle. I, I swear to God, man. I don't know. It around. I swear to God. Swear to me! Number 10. Gordon in his naked ghost train ride is also put to judge a kangaroo court judging an unnamed accused, whom he based on the accusation judges to be thrown at with the book. He then throws the book at the Joker, who blocks it with a cardboard cutout of Batman. Number 11. That musical number from the comic is given composition to have music in it, because this audiovisual media needed it, and I think this was the first and only version they made of it. I go Number 12. Free Joker in his final flashback while being confronted by a slowly and swiftly walking Batman while wearing the Red Hood costume actually falls into a bed of chemicals this time. Number 13. The scene of Batman interrogating ladies of the night is extended with more dialogue to remind us that Brian Azzarello wrote this movie. You'd think the most important thing for him is to... What? Have a good time. So why do you think he hasn't been to visit? I don't know. Maybe he found himself another girl. Number 14. Batman arrives to the carnival with the Batmobile, like how Dumbledore is described in the book asking Harry if he put his name into the Goblet of Fire, contrast to how in the comic he arrived like how Dumbledore is so doing it in the movie. Oh, Harry, you put your name in the Goblet of Fire. Oh, sir. Yes, one of the oldest students to do it for you. No, sir. Number 15. Because of the previous change, Batman is ambushed by the circus freaks, and the animation budget is put into that fight sequence. 
Number 16. The word salad speech the Joker gave to his circus freaks about Gordon being a prop representing the average man driven insane is given to Batman as he fights the circus freaks. Number 17. Batman while chasing the Joker into the House of Mirrors is ambushed by the circus freaks and I'm pretty sure he ends up killing one of them by purposely dragging it down to the spike trap. Number 18. And then there, in their final confrontation, the Joker is the one who sneak attacks on Batman in an upside-down version of his old apartment, which I don't know if it is meant to say that his backstory is the real one. Number 19. And the final part of the movie really showcases how poor the voice acting is with this animation in bringing the comic to life. Lines that Batman and the Joker are supposed to deliver here have the wrong emotion in them. Like how the comic showed the Joker looking and implying that he was sad when saying this. Do you ever think about how many times we've come close to World War 3 over a flock of geese on a computer screen? Oh, silly goose, it's all a joke! Everything anybody's ever valued or struggled for, it's monstrous! Why can't you see the funny side? Why aren't you laughing? Batman sounds too passive-aggressive when he responds back to that, while also roasting the Joker for being too fragile. Because I've heard it before. And it wasn't funny the first time. I spoke with Commissioner Gordon before I came in here. Despite all your sick, cruel, vicious little games, he's as sane as he ever was. So ordinary people don't crack. Maybe it's just you. And the Joker's breakdown into becoming temporarily sane just shows him being mildly frustrated and disappointed, rather than sad and remorseful at what he has done for apparently no reason. Batman also doesn't sound like he is really serious in offering to help the Joker into being rehabilitated, because he sounds too passive, and this look on the Joker's face seems to agree with me. Damn it. Well, what are you waiting for? Kick the hell out of me and get your standing ovation. Come on! I don't want to hurt you. I don't want either of us to end up killing the other. But we're running out of alternatives. Perhaps it all hinges on tonight. I don't know what it was that bent your life out of shape. But maybe I've been there too. Maybe we could work together. I could rehabilitate you. You don't need to be alone. We don't have to kill each other. Let me help you. I'm sorry, but no. No, it's far too late for that. You tell me if the Joker sounded like this when he was relapsing back into madness. Also, seeing as I'm doing this video with Kevin Conroy no longer with us, criticizing his and Mark Hamill's voice acting feels wrong after I, along with so many others, grew up with their voices being synonymous with Batman and the Joker. Unfortunately, this movie decided to use them without a proper direction, and just like with the Justice League duel with David Warner also dead, the Killing Joke movie's latter half in adapting it just feels like wasted potential now, with its first half having ended up as a prime example of what not to do. Oh, and there is also a change number 20, where Barbara is shown to have become Oracle after becoming paralyzed. But again, just like with Justice League Doom's ending, where Batman resigned from the Justice League and Superman gave him Kryptonite as a sign of trust, there are no follow-ups to this movie as it exists in a vacuum, so it ends up meaning nothing. I'll end this rant by saying what they could have or should have done instead. 1. Ignore the 75 minute runtime and focus on adapting only what was in the comic. 2. Put the animation budget into portraying the characters and their actions while adding what required extensions are needed to bridge the scenes. 3. Look into other possible voice actors than just Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill to voice these versions of Batman and the Joker to see who ends up doing it better. Number 4. If you want to do justice to Barbara after what was done to her in the original comic, don't give her an opening to defend herself that she is only going to ignore. And number 5. Remove the reference of her becoming paralyzed and instead leave that as an ambiguity for the viewers to guess 
if it did or didn't happen. So it can equal out with what the Joker is actually shown doing to Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> but what good does that advice do anymore seven years later? So... Next up I will be covering the Batman Ninja anime movie, the subbed version, and I'm also still working on those near replicant video script. Also, seeing how OBS Studio has begun to refuse working with me, I'm going to try learning how stream elements works as a substitute for me to do gameplay streams again in the future. Like or dislike depending on how I was able to cover the killing joke as its source material as well as its adaptation, comment what you have to say about either of them, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe or stay subscribed for videos I have coming next. You can also ding the bell for when I have managed to figure out stream elements to do streams again so you can chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.